I want to read you a verse in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 24. It says this, Jesus was speaking. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it die, it will bring forth much fruit. This is an interesting lesson that Jesus was teaching us. He was saying that in order for a seed to produce, it has to be in the proper environment. Now, if you go to Walmart, there, there's a section that, that, for, that has seeds. And they sell little seeds. If you go to a feed store, they'll have seeds. They're in a little package. And they put them on a peg cook. Tomato seeds, watermelon seeds, squash, you know, sunflower seeds, all kinds of seeds. And the interesting thing is they'll never be anything but a seed as long as they're on that peg cook. In order for that seed to become the miracle that's hidden inside, it has to be in the proper environment. But it's amazing when you take that little tomato seed, or that little mustard seed, and you put it in the right environment, what it can become. Wow, it's amazing. A little pecan can become a mighty tree producing fruit that will sustain you if it's in the right environment. If it's not in the right environment, it's just a little pecan. That's all it is. And so Jesus is explaining to us that, that in order for a seed to produce, it has to be in the right environment. And you know, the Word of God is like a seed. You can have the Word, you can have a Bible at home, and it wouldn't be any good. It might help your, your child to sit up a little higher at the table. But that's all it'll do. But if it's in the right environment, hello, if you take that, that Word out of the book and put it into your heart, oh my goodness, then it can really do some things. Amen. Je Jesus was saying that the seed needs to be in the proper environment. He said, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone, it'll just be a seed. But if it's in the right environment, it'll produce much fruit. And the same is true with the financial seed. See, a portion of our income, a portion of our increase, is supposed to be set aside for the work of the ministry. It's supposed to be given to the Lord. One tenth, one tithe of our increase belongs to God. And when the tithe is placed where it belongs, then it will produce. God said, give it, it shall be given unto you, and it will be multiplied back to you. Many times over, it will be, be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will come back to you, and it will supply all you need according to His riches and glory. But if it's not in the right environment, it's not going to do anything. So God says this. He says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. That's Malachi 3, verse 10. That there might be meat in my house, and prove me now, here which says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. He said, if you will bring the seed into the proper environment, I will bless it. I'll multiply it. I'll make it more than it was. Amen. And it will supply all your needs. And so this morning, I'm going to ask the ushers to come and pass out the offering envelopes. And I want to encourage everyone to get an envelope. And, and even if you say, well, my husband or, you know, I'm going to put an offering in for everyone in the family. That's fine. But everyone get an envelope. Because there's a couple of things I want you to do. One is I want you to turn the envelope upside down. And on the back, there's a place where you can write, write down any prayer request that you have. If there's something you're praying about, if there's something you're believing for, write it down. Because we're going to pray over those needs. And whatever the Lord lays on your heart to do, be faithful to do that. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father. We thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to sow a seed, a financial seed, into the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I ask that you'll supply every need, that you'll heal every hurt. Lord, we bring Brother Charlie Jordan before you. We bring Brother Andrew Byerly before you. We ask that you'll continue to heal and, and help these young men to recover. We bring Evelyn Morales before you. We rebuke cancer in Jesus' name. Father, any member of our church, any part of this church family uh, that needs a healing, Lord, you're our healer. You're our present help in time of trouble. And we just ask you to heal them completely from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. And Lord, direct us in our giving. Show us what you want us to sow. And Lord, let every dollar sown represent a soul one into the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Now prepare your offering. If you're writing a check, just write it out to CLC. If you're giving with your check card or your debit card, make sure you fill out all the information, including the expiration date, your phone number. Of course, you can give by just texting the number on your screen, 940 241 4450, you can text any amount there. And ushers, you can receive this morning's tithes and offering. We have a young man here today that listens to God. I tell you what, he's been a friend for a long time, been a member of Christian Life Center for, wow, a long, long time. Craig, when, when I first met you, were you just out of high school? I was probably in high school. 
You were probably in high school, weren't you? Yeah, that's about 104 years ago. That's, that's how long it was. Uh, it's so crazy. This, this past year, I've mentioned this before, we had a little child uh, enroll in the daycare. And I've been having a lot of kids enroll whose parents were children in our church and school. But this is the first time that I, I asked the, the young lady what her name was. And, and, and you know, one thing led to another. And I realized that the child that was enrolling, his grandmother was in our youth group when we started I said, man, I'm getting, oh, I felt like Moses when she told me that, amen. I want y'all to give Craig Bullock a good welcome as he comes. Come on, give him a good welcome, amen. Good morning. Let, let's, let's start with prayer, if we will. Heavenly Father, we ask that you, that you come join us today, Lord. We are eager to be spirit-filled, and we're searching it, Lord. We ask you personally, Lord, that you, you help me deliver your word, not mine. And that we fill this place, Jesus. We ask that you give a healing to, to the people here and the families and the friends that only you can provide. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get down. Let me give a little introduction to myself. Some of you, I think some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, <clears throat> Pastor was, was kind enough to talk about my age. And <laughs> it barely hurt. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit something about baseball today. Uh, I, I played seven years professionally with the San Diego Padres and the New York Mets. And it was a very rewarding experience for me. I, I the, Probably the most, uh, the most exciting and the most rewarding was the people that I met and the lessons that I learned over time. Uh, I learned a lot of things. After seven years, uh, I learned that I wasn't good enough to play an eighth year. Uh, but I, I learned a few other things. And, and it was the people that taught me things that I hold, I hold on today and I try to share. And I'm gonna share some of that today uh, because I believe that baseball and Christianity or the church, there's a lot in common, more than you know. I can't see very well, but raise your hands or give a hoot if you're a baseball fan. Amen. We got some people here, right? Even after our Astros <laughs> got in a lot of trouble here recently. I don't know if you guys heard, there's a, there's a guy named Leo DeRocher. You have to be a real fan to know who Leo DeRocher is. Leo DeRocher is, a, is an old school manager way back in the days. And he had many, many nicknames. Uh, before I get into this, he, he, he was called Lippy, Leo the Lip, and the All-American Out. And he was called these things because he holds the record for the most ejections ever. <laughs> He'd give umpires a hard time. But he said one time, baseball is like church. Many attend, few understand. And I, I don't know if he knew what he was talking about or not. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure he was an avid churchgoer, uh, but did have a lot of baseball experience. But I, you can tell that he attended enough to, to be able to reference it. Really what we're trying to do, he was talking about a process of making sense of the mysteries of faith. Baseball, if you don't know it, it frustrates the uninitiated. Uh, and I, let, me, let me explain to you. There, there was a couple years ago, both my boys played, but when my son was a lot younger, my youngest son now will be 17 next month. And when he was, uh, I said that yesterday, my, made my wife cry, but I told her she turned 17. But when he was about six or seven, we were watching baseball on TV. And, and the, the Astros were, were giving an intentional walk to the other team. And my son says, what are they doing? Right, what are they doing? Right? The key is to keep people off the base, right? And, and they're now they're giving him a free pass. So we attend many times, but we don't understand. Baseball excites us and inspires us. And should we expect anything different from being a Christian? Are we inspired? Are we excited about coming to church? Baseball, let me tell you some similarities. I wrote down a top 10 list of baseball and Christianity, the similarities of it that, that, I've, that I've uncovered. Number one, most of us have some experience in it. You've played baseball, you've played catch. Uh, you, you come to church, you sing in church. Maybe you've delivered a message. Number two, sometimes it feels like it'll never end. Is that right? Don't tell me you haven't been here on Sunday and worried about the Texans game trying to get out of here. I wonder if Patrick's going to wrap it up. I know you guys did. Not me. Yeah. That's just you guys. And, and baseball, all right, four or five-hour games go on. They go on and they go on and they go on. 
Number three, how about all the traditions? Many traditions in the church that we like to honor. Baseball. I don't know if you know this. When you walk across the white line, the foul line, you don't step on them. All right, bad luck. All right, you step over it. You jump over it. You see a guy step on it. If, it's a, if the game's going fast, don't ever say, man, this game's going really quickly. Oh, man, that's going to go 20 innings now. You just don't say it. There's always a line for food and drink. You ever attend anything from, from a church if they do a charity event? Oh, man, the line's wrapped around the trying to get food and drink. Same thing at a ball game. Number five, it requires sacrifice. Lots of it. And we're going to get into some of that sacrifice here. Number six, at some point, we all get to stand and sing. All right? And by the way, the, 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 uh, the team today did great. And some of you should just stand going forward. I heard the singing from the back there. Somebody, no names. Number seven, it's a team endeavor that's focused on individual commitment. Right? We got a team here at this congregation. We got a team, but you're required to do your part as a Christian. And what does that mean? Right? In baseball, you're, you're alone in the batter's box, but the team's counting on you. Number eight, there's something beautifully unifying in fellowship. We have every walk of life in here. Different races, different genders, different backgrounds. We're all here supporting the same God. Number nine, the participants will never be perfect, but we get to play anyways. You know how you, know how you, you fell 70% in baseball and you're called good. Yeah. And last one, home is the final destination. Amen. Home is the final destination. It's where we get to be safe, right? We all want to get home in baseball. Baseball requires a lot of hope. It's the hope of a hit that keeps the fans watching. It's the hope of a hit that keeps a guy playing. And church, it's for the hopeful. It's not a home for those who have it all together. It's not, it's not a body for those of us who have it all right. It's for those of us who can be hopeful that we're going to be more than what we've become so far. So I wanted to bring a home plate with me. And I was going to sit it up here and I couldn't get my hands on it. Everybody knows what home plate looks like, right? It's a, it's a pentagon, straight up the top, goes down, and it, it, it points at the bottom. Everybody familiar with that? Amen. Home plate. I was going to have it there, and I'm going to, I'm going to get to it. There's a, if you, you've got to be a real baseball fan to, for me to mention this next thing. There, there's an organization called the ABCA, and the ABCA is the American Baseball Coaches Association. This is a, this is a big conference every year that you can attend right now. You don't have to be a major league coach or, or a college coach or a high school coach. You can be a little league coach. You can just be an aspiring coach. Uh, but it's really, really cool because some of the greats of the game come and give keynote speeches. Usually whoever's manager of the year, the year before he comes and gets an award there, and it's a big deal. And they'll have an itinerary where all these speakers come and they talk. <clears throat> and you can attend them all, you can attend some of them, you can do whatever you want. Well, there's one that I, that I wanted to talk about. In 1996, one of the speakers on this was a gentleman by the name of John Scalinos. Raise your hand if you've heard of John Scalinos. If there's a hand that goes up, I'll be amazed. <laughs> Nobody, that's my thing. So John Scalinos, at the time in 1996, was 78 years old. He had this long coaching career at Cal Poly Pomona. And he was a pretty good coach, by the way. But by 96, when everybody's looking at the, at the itinerary of who's speaking, everybody says, hey, Scalinos is talking at 4 o'clock. you got to see this guy. you got to go see John Scalinos. And there were people like Tommy Lasorda on the list, some greats of the game, but everybody wanted to see John Scalinos. You could go to the 2 o'clock meeting, and it was about half full. When Scalinos came in at 4, it was standing room only. And I said, man, this guy... Uh, he, I got to hear what this guy's saying. He comes walking out. He's got like a plaid jacket with the elbow patches, right? And he he kind of lands across. And around his neck is a home plate. It's a full-size home plate. It's hanging around this guy's neck. He speaks for 40 minutes and never once discusses home plate. 
And he's quick-witted, by the way. He was giving some of his, uh, some of his uh, advice that he would give to a team and how he talked to people. And he said, uh, he told his team, he says, look, it's important that we play smart. You're all physically capable, but we've got to be mentally capable. We've got to play smart. And I've got to tell you, he says, I'm not very smart as a coach. He says, one time when I was a kid, I brought home a report card with three A's on it. My mom gave me a beating for cheating. One time after a game, they, they had a, a game on Saturday, they had a double header and they split it. They won the first one, they lost the second one. And the local news says, how do you feel about it, John? He says, you know, I have split feelings. I have mixed feelings about it. It's kind of like watching your mother-in-law drive off the cliff in a Cadillac. That's what he said. He's quick-witted. And then finally at the end of this speech, he says, I know you guys probably think I'm a crazy old man. You're wondering what this home plate is hanging around my neck for. He said, well, I'm not crazy. I know it's there. And he asked a question that I'm going to ask all of you now. I need participants. And if you heard this Wednesday, you can't yell it out, all right? <laughs> if you get it wrong, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll laugh later. But just, I need you to guess. The, the width of home plate in, in Little League, does anybody know the width of home plate? Give a guess. One guess. Not you. <laughs> Somebody thought a guess. What did you say? 10 inches? That's a good guess. Anybody else? 12 inches. 13 and a half. 13 and a half. I will tell you that each one has gotten a little bit closer. 14. 14. 18. One, 18. That's close. The answer is 17 inches. Kind of an odd number, but 17 inches is how wide the high school home plate is. Now, I'm sorry, that's a little league in high school. The, it, the competition gets better. Go to college. How wide is the home plate in college? 24. 24. What else? 22. 22. Plate's getting bigger in college. Maybe last time I'm going to tell you, man. <laughs> My wife, she's cheating. In, in college, it's 17 inches. Same as Little League. But now the pros, you get paid to play. Expectations are bigger. What's the width of home plate in the big leagues? There we go. We're getting it. We're getting it. Just like our God, it never changes. So what happens, he asked. John Scalinos is talking to the group, and he says, what happens when a big leaguer, when he can't throw the ball across those 17 inches? Well, I'll tell you what, we send him to Waterloo. All right, we send him back to the minors. But do we widen it to 18 inches? So he's close. He's always just outside the mark. Do we widen home plate for him? Do we make it 18, 19 inches? What about little Johnny in the little league? Do we widen it for him? He's pretty good. He's cute. He's a cute kid. Throws pretty good. Here's what we don't say. We don't say, hey, it's okay, Jimmy. You can't hit a 17-inch target. We're going to make it 18, 19, even 20 inches so you'll have a better chance. That's not what we do. The game is the game. The rules are the rules. You can either accommodate those rules or you can't play very long. All right? So people, if you were coaches, what do we do when our best players show up late? <clears throat> they show up drunk. Do we bend rules for them? Do we widen the plate for them? Or do we hold them accountable? Do we widen? Do we change the rules to fit people? So we widen home plate. In Romans 14, 12, it is very clear. The word tells us that each of us will give an account to ourselves to God. We'll give an account of ourselves to God. And I'm telling you, I, as the, the, book, the, the parts that I've read the Bible, I don't see any sign of him widening the plate for us. Amen. He's given us mercy and he's given us forgiveness, but the plate's going to be the plate. Are we widening the plate in our homes? Are we widening the plate with our spouses? What are we allowing in the homes today? Look, we can all agree that 2020 has been a doozy. It has been one doozy of the year. We, we, we have been taken for a ride that we never thought we'd be taken on. And we're here. And I wonder if how much we're involved with widening the plate. Do we expect our spouses to be sober? 
Do we expect them? Do we have spouses who don't work? Who don't want to pull their 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 own their own weight? Do we have spouses that are missing kids' events when they don't have to? Are we disrespecting one another? And if so, why are we widening the plate? I've heard Pastor Rodriguez give a marriage. Uh, it was a, a Wednesday, and we were talking about it was you know he was talking about when he counseled counsels in, with marriage couples. And uh, one thing that stuck out to me, he asked this question. And when he asked it, I didn't know the answer, and I couldn't wait to get it. He says, I can ask one question to every couple. And depending on how they answer, it will tell me if they have marriage problems. One question. I was like, wow, this guy's good. And the question is, are you married? <laughs> and if you're married, you got problems. Right? But are we widening the plate or are we fixing them? Are we, are we demanding that our spouses and ourselves do the right things? Another thing that I heard him say one time, he says, one, one, uh, either the man or the wife said, you know, when I, my dog treats me better when I come home. <laughs> and he says, well, do you greet your spouse like the dog greets you when you come home? You know, when I walk in, I got a Doberman Pinscher at the house. And when I open the door, he's going to be at the door waiting on me. Right, tail wagging, and I'm I'm trying to get Michelle to the same. To, uh, she, she keeps widening the plate. Uh, in First Timothy chapter three, one through seven, I'm going to read it for you. If you want to get to it, you can, but I'm going to read it. It says, "This saying is reliable." This is the common English version, by the way. If anyone has a goal to be a supervisor in the church, and I want to define that to the message today. This particular message was talking about actually attending the church and being a supervisor in it and, and being someone that was working in it. I want to talk about it from the metaphorical church here at the Church of Christ. If you want to be a supervisor, and if you are a Christian, you are a supervisor of that church. Either way, either way you slice it. They want a good thing, so they must be without fault. They should be faithful to their spouse, sober, modest, and honest. They should show hospitality and be skilled at teaching. How do you become skilled at teaching? You've got to read a lot of it. You've got to know what you're talking about. They shouldn't be addicted to alcohol or be a bully. Instead, they should be gentle, peaceable, and not greedy. They should manage their own household well. They should see that their children are obedient with complete respect, not some respect. Because if they don't know how to manage their own household, how can they take care of God's church? They shouldn't be new believers, so they won't be proud and fall under the devil's spell. They should also have a good reputation with those outside the church so that they won't be embarrassed and fall into the devil's trap. Are we widening the plate at home? And I'm telling you we are. I had two friends, when I talk about the devil's trap, I had two friends that I was, I was going on a trip with recently and we got into the, the subject of God on this, on this video. And we talked about, someone said, how can all this evil exist? How can it be this big, this bold? And, and so my, what I was going to tell him was, if you take the foundation of evil, which is the devil himself, if he's that big, the evil's going to be that big. It's bigger than we can realize. It's bigger than we have, we have taken account for. So it's going to be big. It's a massive amount of evil. And I said, well, do you guys believe in the devil? They believed in God. I said, do you believe in the devil? And both of them said, no. It floors me. How can we be Christians and not believe in the devil? Right? That would make God a liar. Right? Talks about him all the time. We're widening the plate for, for, for that kind of rhetoric. When we talk about being parents in the home, I have a kid on one of my baseball teams. I coach some baseball teams. I have a kid on my baseball team where the mom reaches out to me recently, and the kid likes me a lot. Uh, doesn't know me well yet, but he's, he's getting there. No, he likes me a lot. We've got a good relationship. I, I, I'm, I have a good, close relationship with my, my team. And uh, he's a junior in high school, and she just put him in a... In a in a home because he's doing drugs he mess around with drugs and I got to reach out to him I had to put in all these codes and uh, you know family and friends only and I, I reached out to him and he answered he's like hey coach and I'm like hey what's going on man and his first comment to me after that was I don't belong here he didn't say hi to me he said I don't belong here I said well why do you say that he says this is a mental ward these people are crazy I said, well, I don't think it's a mental ward. 
I think it's a behavioral home that has an umbrella of a lot of different categories. This coach don't belong here. Are you doing drugs? Yes, sir, he says. Maybe you do. Right, we get to talk a little longer, and then I find out a lot about his situation. And this comes from the mother, she told me. She said, I don't know what to do with him. He's getting out of control, she says. And she said, well, he, he's had a tough life, Coach. Uh, his real dad wasn't around, and he was adopted by a man that she married early on. And this man, who was going to take on a father role, was very abusive. He would tell him as a young kid in T-ball, if he didn't perform well in the field, I'm ashamed that you wear the same last name as me on the back of your shirt. That embarrasses me that you have my name. So that guy, that guy leaves. There was someone else that she's been with about six months. This guy recently challenged him to a fight. That sounds productive. And so I wonder, are we widening the plate at home? You can't control him because we, the foundation's broken. We've been widening the plate for too long and now we want to get back into the rules. It's too late. We, we, we got to start now. We got to start, stop widening the plate. Amen. The best advice for a strong household, we ask this, and it's very simple in my opinion. And you can, you can reference it on how we're told to love, uh, how we're told to love God in Luke 10, 27. It says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind. It doesn't talk about taking anything. It talks about giving. And when it says, with all your heart, we're talking about emotionally. Do you love emotionally? With all your being, do you love spiritually? So your strength, do you love physically? And with your mind, do you love mentally? It all matters. You can break people with all four of those. Are we widening the plate? We talk about our kids. Our kids today. We love our kids, right? They're adorable. They're cute. They make us laugh. They bring us a lot of joy. I have two sons, and I can't imagine having more joy than those guys. But when I, sometimes I look around at what's happening today. I look at how they're dressed. Who are they aspiring to be? Who are they following? Who are the mentors? Do you know? How do they talk? Who do they hang out with? What are they watching? What are they listening to? Listen, last year they wanted to ban a Christmas song about baby it's cold outside. And today the number one hit, or a couple months ago even, the number one hit in the nation was a song called WAP. And I can't even tell you what it stands for. <laughs> What's happened to us? The song WAP is it's pure filth. And it's celebrated. We're widening the plate. It's complete nonsense. Look, you could go on YouTube and watch teenage kids watch, give, let their, showing their mother and father the video WAP because they're trying to get a reaction so they can get more views. And the parents finally found out what it's about and they're like, oh, goodness. But there's no condemnation of, hey, turn this off. What are we allowing? We're stretching home plate beyond measure. It's not okay. Look, if, if, you're, if your kid is dressed like a gangster, like a crook, and there's a good chance he might end up that way. We have, a, we have a due diligence to make sure our kids follow a path. And it needs to be around the Bible. We're afraid to open it up. It's not, it's, it's not just a... Uh, a coaster. What about our political scope? Good grief. Do we have problems in the political world? Raise your hand if you believe we do. Yeah, I'll be unanimous. All right? Hey, 51 years ago, listen to this. 51 years ago, we landed on the moon. 51 years ago. Do you know the technological advances of 51 years? I saw the other day that uh, a, a Navy SEAL has a scope now that can see around corners. Yeah. The technology is bizarre. Yeah. We went to the moon 51 years ago, but we're hand counting ballots? <laughs> what? Are we believing this? Right? You mean to tell me some volunteers back here? One. <laughs> two. <laughs> Come on. 
We got on the moon. Hey, don't talk to me. I'm, I'm at 1,480. I don't want to lose my count. When I go back to the kids, we talk about Bill Cosby. I don't know if he's the best reference to use. He's had some struggles of his own. But I will tell you this. He gave some parental advice one time that I agree with. He was, he, he was talking about kids. And somebody said, well, I, I can't get my kid to do what he wants. I tell him to move over there. And he says, no. And then I say, no, I mean it. You move over there. And he says, no. So I don't know what to do with it. And Bill Cosby says, you get over there, you move him to where you want him to go. Right? Quit widening the plate. If you throw 18 inches, it's not at the ball. We need 17 inches. Our political scope is all over the place. It's not just the voting, by the way. There's, there's, there's a lot of things that are going on. We have a situation where we have candidates, both of them. We have medias that are telling us proudly that both the candidates raised over $100 million for the campaigns that they ran this election. Yeah, we're going to have people tonight somewhere in this city go to bed hungry. We're talking about $100 million that get raised. We're widening the plate. We're celebrating that like it's a good job. And some kid's going to go without a sandwich today. Does that make any sense to you? Why are we allowing it? Why don't we just watch it and say nothing? Everything today, the racist issues of today, wow. Now we all know racism exists, we know that, right? But to say, hey, let's do this, we're gonna end racism. You're not gonna end racism. Until you end Satan himself, you're not gonna do it. That's right. right, evil is going to exist. Until you can go to the heart of every single person, every single home, and change their hearts, racism will exist. That's just the way it is. We have an organization called Black Lives Matter. Do Black Lives Matter? Of course they do. Of course they do. But the organization itself, go look at the, bene go look at the benefactors for the money being raised there. We're talking billions of dollars being raised, and the people who are getting the most are old, rich, white politicians. It makes you ask. I haven't seen a scholarship go to a, 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 a poor black child. I haven't seen ghettos resurrected. What are we doing? We're widening the plate. We're widening the plate. We're listening to the rhetoric we're giving. They're, they're hitting on our outrage. They're hitting on our emotions. And we're losing the big picture. Everything is attacked as racist today. I feel this way, I, but I feel differently. You're racist. Being called a racist is a weapon at this point. It's worse than that. Being accused of racism is actually worse than being a racist. Have you seen the reactions of people when they get called racist? Oh, I, I, I got this friend, he's white. And, you know, I got this friend, he's black. Right? We, we start defending it. As if we're no good. Yet when I walk around in the streets, I, I did my own sociological studies here. I walk around in the parks, and people of all colors were waving at each other, smiling. I don't see the hate until I turn the TV on. Yeah. And is there hate? Yes, of course there is. I've seen some of it. It's there. It's there. What do you do when you're around evil? You try to change the evil or you get away from it. We're not changing the devil. His path is set in stone. How about the lies that we get? During all this political scope. Back when Hillary was running, I, and you know, I'm not here to tell you which way to lean politically left or right. I really don't care. That, but you know, she loses, she loses 33,000 emails. We're okay with it. No big deal. It happens to people. Don't know where they're gone. She said, oh, these were confidential. I didn't know anything about it. They're confidential. People are lying right in our face, and we're allowing it. Journalism is dead. Ratings mean money. Division means ratings. Don't lose sight of that. Why are we widening home plate? Here's another political issue that I don't even know why it's a political topic. The subject of abortion always comes up really strong every four years. Every year. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-choice. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-choice. And you got 50% here. How dare you? Right? It's my body. And here, how dare you? You're killing. And so, then you start looking at some of the numbers, by the way. 
when I look at the numbers of abortions that are happening, when people, people quickly go to this about abortion, well, what about people who are raped? What about medical issues where the child's life is in danger or it might endanger the life of the mother? What do we do in their situations? Pro-lifer, what do we do? Well, we can be reasonable. If you look at the number, the percentage of rape, so last year there were 800,000 abortions. And that's down, by the way. We're making progress. 800,000 abortions. Less than 0.5% were because of rape. And they couldn't put the number on it. It could be 0.0001%. It's less than 0.5. Medical issues are right under 5%. So it leaves about 95% that are done out of convenience. 95% yeah. are done out of convenience. I can't afford it. If it affects my career. Not ready for a child. Convenience. I had an educated friend. I had a, I had a friend who posted on Facebook recently. And he was, he was talking about the, uh, the presidential candidates. And he said... To my Christian friends, how can you, can you validate or justify how you can support a candidate who is pro-choice? That's what he said. It's interesting. I, I knew when he posted it, the conversation would go nowhere. It would go round and round, right? Well, Christian friends weren't the only ones that responded. What responded was the, the typical abortion debates that never, that never end. And I got to talking to one of my, he was, a, oh, he was a baseball buddy. His baseball friend. He was a very smart guy, by the way. He's very articulate. He chooses words well, and he's insightful. And we go back and forth, and I share with him statistics, and he says, hey, Craig, I guess there's no real easy answer. And I said, that's not true at all. The, the answer is very, very simple. It's a decision we're struggling with. The answer is simple, because when I go to the Bible, in Jeremiah 1.5, it says, this is God saying, before I created you in the womb, before you were in the womb, I knew you. I set you apart. And then the physical life cycle begins in the womb. If it goes uninterrupted for any point, I don't care if it's a mass or not, if it goes uninterrupted by us or God, it's going to grow into an old person. And Deuteronomy says in 517, it's real short to the point. Do not kill. I knew you before you were in the womb. Do not kill. If you can take those two and justify being pro-choice, okay, but you'll, we'll have to be accountable one day. We're going to have to be accountable. We've got to quit stretching home plate to meet our conveniences. The answer is simple. The decision is critically hard to make. I get it. What about widening the plate for Christianity itself? We have authorities in major religions who are sexually and emotionally abusing kids and we're sweeping it under the rug. Misrepresenta misrepresentation of the word of God is being abused. We can't allow non-believers, which we might be outnumbered at some point, to share their definitions of what Christ is or who he is, and it, which actually it defies what the word of God is telling us. My, edu my educated friend that I was talking to you just about, and we get into the subject of the Bible, and he's not, a, he, he's not an atheist, but he's agnostic. But he, but he, and this is what he tells me. He says, Craig, the Bible is not all facts. Jesus was a good person. He did good deeds. And the Bible was written for guidance and hope. And there's no way, if I believe in God, that I can let that go. Right? It's an uncomfortable situation, but I can't let it go because that's not true. The Bible is 100% factual. Amen. right? And if you ask this question, anybody, do you believe it's all facts? Most people say, I haven't read it all. That's not the question. It doesn't matter what you've read. You either believe God is the king of kings or he's not. When we talk about he's a good person, he didn't come here to say he was a good person. He did do good deeds, but what he said was, I am the son of God. That's what he said. So he is either the son of God or a maniacal liar. And if he's a maniacal liar, he can't be a good person. Because the devil doesn't hide who he is. He's a deceiver, but we know who he is. That would make God even more evil because he's hiding behind good deeds. 
Right? He, that, that's, the, that's the deception of, of, of a lifetime. But he's not. He says, I'm the son of God. He didn't hide it. He wasn't killed because he did good deeds. He was killed because he was God. In 2 Corinthians, this is Paul talking to, to the Corinthians. He says, but I'm afraid that your minds might be seduced in the same way as the snake deceived Eve with his devious tricks. You might be unable to focus completely on a genuine and innocent commitment to Christ. He says, if a person comes and preaches some other Jesus than the one we've preached, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you've received, or a different gospel than the one you embrace, you put up with it so easily. He was expressing a little bit of disappointment here. Right, that they can say anything and we believe it other than the fact of the truth that we know. We have to quit widening home plate. We're careful with Jesus. Right? When, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it's brought up, we're careful with it. People don't want to talk about it because it's not the right place. It's not the right time. I'm here to tell you today that it is always the right time to talk about our God. It is always the right time to call him our Savior. It is always the right time to recognize him as the King of Kings. And he's not going to widen home plate, and I'm so thankful to God that, that, he, that he won't. I'm thankful to God that he's, that he's forgiven me for the times that I have. And I'm thankful to God that uh, he, he allowed me to come speak today and, 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 and deliver what I hope was his word. And I hope it meant something to you. And on the back of home plate, I can tell you, I, the reason I want to bring it, I want to turn around that if we keep widening it, on the back side of it, that's what we're going to get, which is darkness. The back side of home plate is always dark. And as I end here, it only feels right, as we talk about widening home plate, that pastors, we could have maybe a little bit of music and, and we have a, a calling if somebody wants to have a prayer up here or, or, or if somebody wants to accept Christ for the first time. If you've widened the plate and you've avoided it, because it, it makes you uncomfortable. It's not the right time, the right place. I'm telling you, today's the right time, and today's the right place. Amen. You're here with people who love you, and people who want to accept you, and introduce you to the God that we all love, and embrace, and, and, and adore. And so if anybody wants to come up, if you, want, if you just want to pray together, I'd like to do it, and Pastor Rodriguez will do it, and, and anything that we can do, I, I, I'm excited. And, and guys, I thank you for letting me speak, and uh, thank you. Listen, I want to encourage you to invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. If you haven't done that already, do that now. All you got to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash them away with your blood. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. And I make a vow to serve you, Jesus, as Lord of my life for the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer with me, if you believe it in your heart, you confess with your mouth, you're saved. Amen. And I want to ask you if you would consider sowing a financial seed into the ministry. That it's simple to do. All you got to do is text any amount to the number on your screen, 940-241-4450. That number again is 940-241-4450. You can text any amount to that number. Or if you'd like, you can go on our web uh, site, clc-church.com. That's clc-church.com. And on the menu bar, the word, you'll see the word give. Click on the button that says give. A menu will drop down, and you can give through PayPal that way. Or if you'd like to mail an offering in, you can do that. Our mailing address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. And the zip is 77339. That's 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. Zip is 77339. Of course, my favorite way for you to give is to come into the church and fellowship with us. We just want to get to meet you and love you and uh, pray with you. And we hope to see you here soon. Come out and visit us, Christian Life Center here in Kingwood, Texas. Once again, thanks for watching. God bless you.